Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome uh, to the University of Melbourne's Water Security Seminar Series, uh, Contaminants of Emerging Concern, which I know is a topic of interest to many of us. Uh, my name is Sandra Kentish, and I'm head of the School of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Melbourne. Uh, before I introduce uh, the proceedings for tonight, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place. Uh, that's the land of the Wurundjeri people and pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, but let me introduce the event tonight. It's part of a series we're having in discussing important issues surrounding water security, where we aim to bring together thought leaders from academia, industry and government to provide evidence-based insights and raise the quality of debate around these key issues. Tonight, as you know, we're focusing on contaminants of emerging concern. We have four outstanding speakers this evening who will present this topic to you, and I'll introduce each of them now before they present, but uh, so if we can introduce them in turn. And so um, the, the first speaker uh, who will give a uh, presentation is Dr. Bradley Clark. Uh, Dr. Brad Clark is currently a senior lecturer in environmental science and analytical chemistry at the University of Melbourne uh, and lead researcher of the Australian Laboratory for Emerging Contamin Contaminants, ALEC is the acronym, uh, and that's an industry collaboration with uh, the companies Agilent and Neurofins. Prior to this, he was Program Manager of Environmental Science at RMIT um, from 2016 to 19 and he's also held research positions at Imperial College London and the University of Arizona. Brad's industry-aligned research focuses on assessing the risk to public health and the environment from legacy and emerging persistent organic pollutants, including per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, which you all know as PFAS, brominated flame retardants and microplastics. Our second speaker tonight will be Dr Judy Blackburn. Uh, Judy is the Manager of Applied Research at Melbourne Water, where she's responsible for managing a team with a diverse research portfolio. She holds a PhD from Deakin Uni and a Master's from the University of Queensland. And she's worked in a variety of research, consulting and management roles in South Africa, the United Kingdom and Australia. Our third speaker will be Professor Peter Scales. Uh, Peter is a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering in the School of Engineering at the University of Melbourne. He's director of the Particulate Fluids Processing Centre and co-chair of the Urban Water Group of the Sustainable Water Futures Program of Future Earth. And finally, our fourth speaker will be Dr Cathy Northcote. Cathy is a Chartered Chemical Engineer and Fellow of the Institute of Chemical <coughs> Engineers with 23 years experience predominantly in the water industry. She's experienced in development of robust and reliable water treatment uh, solutions for remote, regional and industrial sites to address a range of water quality issues such as heavy metals and PFAS contamination. In particular, Cathy has been involved in the wastewater plant design for the Australian Antarctic Division. And you might want to ask her a few questions about that later. Uh, but to begin proceedings, we're going to get an overview of the topic from uh, Bradley Clark. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Clark to come up now uh, to the, the microphone. Thanks for the invitation to speak here tonight. In many ways, what we've been experiencing in the last uh, century is really a chemical revolution. Um, the scale and the technology of our ability to manipulate matter has transformed all of our lives. So a lot of things we take for granted. So, and things that we expect from one society. So, uh, you know, our, our iPhones, our computers, the seats, the phones, the buildings, all of this is from our knowledge of chemistry and our knowledge of matter. However, the flip side of all of this is that every single person is now exposed to synthetic chemicals from the moment of conception until the moment of death. So I get I for the cheery job of doing the, the uplifting part of the talk. So you all, it doesn't matter when you're born, you all have uh, a body burden of legacy pollutants in your, in your body. And this includes things that have never been used in some of the life forms like uh, DDT and like, pesticides. Now, they have accumulated in your body, and 
this is, this is the reason why I'm really interested in this topic. Because um, particularly for, for young families and, and women, when you're going to uh, you're pregnant, you're going to draw upon your energy reserves and your, your developing child is going to be exposed to a, a, top, a soup of industrial chemicals. Now, one of the things that I'm going to talk about as well is that we're not really learning our lessons. So we had DDT and DCD as the first generation, and we phased them out because they accumulated in our bodies and our toxins. Uh, we, we now have a second and third generation of the system of organic pollutants that are accumulating in our body and causing harm to the population. Some of the health impacts include reproductive health problems, impaired immune systems, and uh, neurological damage. This, for me, is one of the most striking images that I've seen in the scientific literature, which is a um, evidence of decreased intelligence exposed from children that are exposed to pesticides. So side by side with this in Mexico, we have uh, normal functioning of the three-year-old and then, um, I guess, unintelligible on the other side. So exposure to these chemicals can have serious impacts on um, children and the population. But I'm going to give you 10 minutes to talk. Um, and uh, so I am going to talk about two case study chemicals. Um, PFAS is the first one. So PFAS is probably the hottest topic in environmental science outside of climate change. And PFAS is basically an organic, we have a carbon chain and taken off the hydrogen and made more fluorine, essentially. They're very stable and they were used for about 50 years before we um, realised that PFOS, I'm with PFAS, is in every single living organism on the planet, including you. Um, we've seen some phase outs of this chemistry and we sort of saw the industry lead, so this is after 50 years of exposure, lead in a phase out of two types of PFAS, PFOS and PFAL. So one of the arguments that I'm going to make is that we are not managing chemicals properly at this point. So we have PFOS, PFAR, that are being widely used uh, within society. We ban these chemicals, or we say these aren't good, so let's replace them. The chemical industry's response was to build families of chemicals surrounding us. So for those people, give a little bit of chemistry lesson again, okay? <laughs> We had a fully fluorinated carbon backbone and then we had a functional group. So what they did, this chemical here is banned, let's chop off one carbon and call it something else and that one's not banned. Let's chop off two carbons and let's use that as well. So they made about 30 different PFASs now that we need to measure. So we originally had two, now we have 30. This actually gets worse, they uh, extended this uh, universe of PFAS and now includes over 6,100 million PFASs. How do we monitor for this? How do we regulate for this? This is quite a significant problem. How this relates to the water sector is the Victorian EPA, in an effort to protect people, has said there should be some regulation around PFAS. I'm focusing on the wastewater side of this. Uh, let the when they calculated their 99% of confidence recommendation, it was less than one nanogram per litre. Every single wastewater treatment plant excellent throughout the entire world has PFAS in at higher levels than this. So the question, and this is some data, this is Australian data that shows that the mean um, concentration of some total PFAS is about 80 nanograms for the this is Australian survey. The question really becomes what does what does it mean, and how do we get rid of all these chemicals from effluents? It raises a lot of questions about uh, water recycling. It raises a lot of questions about environmental discharge. And for me, the only way we tackle this problem is at the source. We have, to, we have to stop these chemicals coming into the system. The second one I'm going to talk about is microplastics. Now, microplastics is another hot topic that everyone or maybe more so last year before, that everyone really concerned about. And the reason for that is because we can see them. So PFOS, PFAS, we can't really see, microplastics we can see. 
So anyone with a microscope now can go down to the beach, uh, take it out your sample of sand, and look at the microscope under the, under the microscope. Now, for me, this is an example of where the water set that is to engage with um, producers of uh, cosmetics, for example, and say, not good enough. So, for about 10 years, Unilever and other big corporations were incorporating polyethylene into a lot of um, consumer products. So, over three, about 2,500 different products have polyethylene incorporated into them. There's only one place that, when you, if you're using if you're using these things in your shower, there's only one place to end it up, and there's all these different types of plastics. You use them in your shower, you go down the drain, they end up at the wastewater treatment plant, and the wastewater treatment plant has to deal with the problem that they didn't create. It's exactly the same for PFAS. And I'm just seeing you mentioned that you're probably a significant source of PFAS load coming through to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the food contact paper that you're, when you get your Uber Eats takeaway is probably a source of PFAS contamination and then you're eliminating that and it's getting out of the treatment plant. So these personal care products in this situation can only go to one place, can only go to the wastewater treatment plant and then they have the task, the problem of having to deal with pollution that the uh, community is generating. And the community, and it would be quite reasonable for the community to accept that the union leader wouldn't put a product, wouldn't put a component into a product that was only going to end up in this slot, in my opinion. Now, unfortunately, most of the microplastics are actually now associated with the, the residual solids of the wastewater treatment plant, and this makes a significant problem. And my last, well, I spoke two more points. Whenever I talk about a chemical, people say, well, what are the health impacts? And that's a really good question. It's also one of the toughest ones to answer. And if we go back, I'm going to use a bit of a sideways analogy. Um, lead. Lead is actually associated with violent crime. You can do a correlation between uh, the amount of lead in the ambient atmosphere and violent crime, and it's been shown quite clearly in the US. This one, I'm going to take the first step over, okay? In, the, in the, um, America had a spate of serial killers as well in the 70s and 80s. What about, imagine if this is exposure to this environmental contaminant caused these extreme acts of violence. Now, when we do a risk assessment, we've never been asked to do an endpoint of a serial killer endpoint, but this is the potential that we need to be thinking about in different ways. What about if all exposure to all these chemicals is impairing our intelligence? How many more people are we making disabled per year? These are questions I think we need to think about. This is what we are dealing with at the moment. We're chasing our tails. A chemical manufacturer brings out a new chemical. About five to ten years later, an environmental scientist realises that, that chemical has been introduced to market. We get some data, the regulators then pick it up, and they say, maybe we should do something about this. And then it gets banned, maybe. This whole loop is going on over and over again, and it's just getting worse. We can't keep up. My lab can analyse 59 PFAS. That's one of the highest amount of PFAS that anyone in this country can measure. There's over 6,000, that's like less than 5%. What we need to do is break the cycle. And it's happened here. There needs to be a discussion between uh, the regulator and the chemical manufacturer. They need to prove that these chemicals don't cause harm before they're introduced to market, and they also need to prove that they don't have an impact on the water sector, in my opinion. This is the number of unique chemicals registered in the CAS database. 147 million. It's gone up by 7 million since I gave this talk about two months ago. We need to do something and then we need to break the cycle of, of how we're managing chemicals in our society. So that's, I, did, I, did that, I did the uplifting side of the talks. Um, and I think that's, that's all from there.
I'll ask you not to sit down, you have to sit here. And I will invite my other panel members to come up to the stage. In what you think the key issues are for Melbourne Water, um, whether you think perhaps we've gone too far for regulation, Bradley mentioned a very low uh, barrier for PFAS that's quite difficult for companies like yourselves to meet. Uh, so do you think we've gone too far? Do these regulations protect public health and the environment or is it a bit of a feel-good exercise? Okay, there's some... Can you hear me? Yeah. It doesn't sound like it's on from this one. Okay, yes, it was red, I should have guessed that. <laughs> okay, so um, Bradley finished off with what our major problem is, 147 million chemicals, and as he mentioned, growing all the time. So even if one in a thousand goes into production, it's still going to be a huge number of chemicals for us to think about and work out how we're actually going to manage that. Um, but we, needn't, we shouldn't be thinking of all of these as bad chemicals. Just think about all the pharmaceuticals that this room full of people are likely to be on. Some of these pharmaceuticals are essential, but they can also form some of the emerging contaminants because we excrete them, sometimes metabolites, sometimes uh, the, the parent product. And so these will also make their way down to the wastewater treatment plant. We wouldn't want to be without those. So we do need to keep that perspective. An issue for us as a water utility is actually knowing which contaminants could be coming from point sources, for instance from a trade waste source, and which could be coming from diffuse sources. With some it's clear, with others it's not that clear. And as Brad mentioned, you know, source control is the best way if we can do that. The other thing is, can we measure them? Well, the answer clearly is no. Sewage is a very difficult matrix to measure, um, especially obscure contaminants in. The methods aren't there for more than probably a few thousand. And if we did, do we have the guidelines? Would we know how to interpret the data? So the, these are some of the issues that, 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 that we face. <coughs> and then, of course, some of these ones break the laws of chemistry. PFAS is, well, not really, but you know what I mean. We didn't expect it would have the mobility that it had. And that came as a surprise, I believe, to many people. One of the things that it would be great to see a better action on, and we try, and that is how can each of us individually, how can householders, manage disposal of chemicals better? You know, the sewer is a very easy place to get rid of things. I'm thinking, for instance, of a cupboard in my laundry with a whole lot of unused veterinary medicines. The pets are long gone. I'm not quite sure what to actually do with these. I, traditionally, I would have put them down the sewer. I don't do that anymore. Half-filled tins of paint, what do you do with them? Maybe there's some room there for us to actually take action on some of these that can land up as contaminants that cause us problems. And the problems can come in in terms of aspects of resource recovery. We don't just want to put out waste products. We'd like to be able to recover resources where we can. So biosolids are a classic example. I know Brad has worked a lot in that area. They have a lot of good nutrients in them. Uh, can we use them? Or are there potential issues with some of the contaminants coming through? And uh, microplastics would probably be a key one coming to mind. Do we know the environmental consequences of these? One of the other things we need to think about, too, is not just environmental, but what could be risks to staff who are working in the sewers? People do have jobs that require them to go down there. What could emerging contaminants do to our wastewater treatment plants? And what could they be doing to the environment and the bio biota in that? Now, I don't want to go on too long, Sandra. Do you want me to talk okay. briefly about regulation? Yeah, well, you can go for yes. it. You've got, we've got an hour. Yes. Okay. <laughs> then, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't want to bother. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Regarding regulation, I think one thing we've got to recognise is that it is complex, and regulation takes time. Um, we also need to recognise that there are established processes, and I don't know how many people are really aware of these processes. There's quite a lot going on in terms of regulation of PFAS, for instance. But in this instance, um, the heads of EPA have put out a document. 
And what is good is we get the chance to comment. And that's not just water utilities. Everyone in the audience can actually comment. Um, there's a website, engage.vic.gov.au. You can have your say. And that can be taken into account. The other thing we have in Victoria is that if a regulation comes out, they also have to do a regulatory impact statement. You know, what is that going to cost? Who is that going to affect? So regulation um, is, is pretty well uh, laid out and it's really a matter of understanding that. You did mention the very low PFAS concentration for fresh water, which is 0.2 nanograms per litre. I think we are the standout, perhaps, um, internationally with having that low level. Interesting to look at the fact that in deriving guidelines, we do need toxicology data. That was based on one study, zebrafish in freshwater, and it was an intergenerational study. That study is being repeated, and more toxicological studies are becoming available. So it will be interesting to actually see what becomes of that guideline. But with PFAS being a chemical that is so persistent, toxic, bioaccumulative, and mobile, you can un understand to some extent why um, such a tough guideline has been set. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I think that was very informative. I'm going to pass to Cathy now, so she can have the microphone next. And Cathy, I'm interested, given the universe of chemicals that Brad's mentioned, how would you see future compliance issues for regulators and utilities? Particularly thinking about Judy's response, what are the issues for the smaller utilities that you think will be engaged with? Yep. All right. Okay, so I just want to point out that uh, tonight I'm kind of at war with myself um, in the sense that I'm trying to answer from a practical operational perspective whilst also being a research manager for Water Research Australia. So the, the responses I make, um, from an operational perspective, it's going to sound like I'm anti-research, but that's not actually the case. Um, I think we do need much more research. <laughs> Uh, it's just that as operators, we can't afford to wait for the answers in terms of the science because sometimes it's too late um, for us in an operational sense. So moving on to that, I'd like to make my first controversial statement of the day, um, and that is from an operational perspective, uh, if we're talking about adequately managing the risks of emerging contaminants in drinking and recycled water, uh, using traditional methods of sampling and testing uh, and the use of conventional treatment technologies, we're ultimately doomed for failure. That's inevitable. So that's my first controversy of the day. Um, the issue is particularly problematic for the smaller utilities in the sense that they don't have the budgets and the ability to pay to do costly investigations and exercises to find those really complex solutions to these problems. Sometimes they don't even have the budgets to actually do the testing for the emerging contaminants that regulators are actually asking them to test for in their source waters. So looking at the traditional testing and sampling methodology for smaller utilities is you're on a hiding to nowhere, basically. Um, so I actually think that we need to change, we need to flip our brains a bit in terms of our governance approach towards emerging contaminants. Um, and I suggest we learn from our successes using HACCP and CCP approaches uh, that we use both in the drinking water guidelines and also in the guidelines for water recycling. Um, and they've been set up for pathogen risks, but there is some potential there to actually use those approaches for chemicals of, con of emerging concern, emerging contaminants. Um, one good example is something that was called the Water Val Program. It was originally called NatVal and it was developing a series of uh, process barriers, treatment barriers, uh, treatment protocols and, uh, for pathogens. But what it did was it set, uh, it opened the door for potential similar um, opportunities to maybe look at classes of chemicals as well um, and using mechanisms of removal across treatment barriers as an approach. What it means is that you don't need to have you know, the detailed toxicology, epidemiology information at your fingertips. You just need an understanding of what that broad class of chemicals is about and how it could potentially be removed across the process barrier. So that means that regulators 
and operators don't need to be chemical experts. They don't need to know 147 million chemicals. They just need to know how a particular chemical class might behave uh, across a certain barrier. Um, and yeah, that's my response. Thank you, Cathy. You can pass the microphone to Peter. And Peter, having heard from Cathy that we have this potential to set up a sequence of barriers to remove PFAS, what might those barriers be? Well, how are we going to, what, is, what would be the strategies uh, to remove all those contaminants from water? How would you go about doing that? Perhaps from a research perspective, see. Oh, hopefully a, a practical perspective as well. The, the, the key issue that sits here in terms of something like a wastewater treatment plant, and, and, and that's not the only source of contamination into the environment. There's obviously stormwater runoff. There's a whole range of other inputs into the environment. But... Clearly, if we bring uh, a thousand megalitres of water into our city in Melbourne every day and we, we send most of it to a wastewater treatment plant and we contaminate it, then that is one place where we can hopefully do quite a lot of, of work. The issue is that most wastewater treatment plants in the world actually are looking to just make the wastewater low in nitrogen, reasonably low in carbon, so it doesn't have a biological oxygen demand. Pathogen, not free, but, but not quite a few pathogens out and actually assimilate it to the environment. That's been the process we've used for the last 12,000 years or probably longer. The, this, this actually says that model is still okay, but to actually achieve an outcome that says we weren't putting emerging contaminants out into the environment, we would need to put probably at least two and maybe three extra barriers into that system. We need a barrier that can oxidise things if it's for pharmaceuticals. Something like PFAS, not particularly oxidisable, so in that context, not good. Uh, if you can't oxidise it and you can't absorb it to a surface and you can't biodegrade it, that's the normal process we use, then the argument is that we would need to put a physical barrier in the road. And for very small molecules, like some of the PFASs, we're talking nanofiltration. We're down at that level. People would say RO is a guarantee. You can do it with nanofiltration. So therefore, a combination of not just thinking about PFAS, but thinking about things like triclosan, things like uh, some of the pharmaceuticals, the, the BPAs and other things, oxidation steps, absorption steps, physical barrier steps, typically we don't have those on any discharge system. We might have one of them or two of them, but rarely do we have all of those. Therefore, I can make the system clean in terms of the water output. That still produces a, a concentrate or a solids. That is, your microplastics, that's your PFAS stream, that's going to go back into your biosolids. And then you've got an issue with, well, what do we do with the biosolids? We would hope that we could uh, reuse those biosolids, but almost certainly not for food or agricultural purposes, which has been the main use of those around the world. So all of a sudden, you say, what are the consequences? I can actually put three barriers in the road. I can, I can actually create very clean water. The quality of water you can produce would be as good as the drinking water that comes out of our taps. Therefore, you would ask yourself, well, why would I discharge it to the environment at that point? I would have spent so much money on it that I wouldn't want to. But one of the other things is I have produced a concentrate stream that makes things like our biosolids impractical in terms of the word biosolids. They become, they don't become a product, as Judy said. They become, they become something we're going to have to pyrolyze or burn. Therefore, I, I think 
the barriers are that we need to think about the solids barrier and whether or not we need to pyrolyze those systems and we need to think about whether or not we, we have two to three extra barriers in our water treatment process. Judy's probably going to say, that's tough for Melbourne water. If I go to somewhere like a small retailer up in central Victoria that's got 10 passive plants, that's really tough. I'll leave it at that for the moment to say, yes, we can treat it. Yes, we can produce clean water. Yes, we can break this pollution cycle. But it's, that, that's possible, but how do you implement? Perhaps another question later is a different one. Yep. Well, I'm going to leave that question on a little bit to Brad. Um, and so I think uh, what we're hearing from Peter is that these approaches are going to be expensive, uh, both from a cost point of view, but I also add from an energy point of view, which in turn is adding greenhouse gases into the environment. Um, how do we, what's, from a philosophical point of view, how do we address this with the public? Do we just say your water bills are going to go up? Uh, and, or, or, uh, and you have to accept that? Or, or is the public going to say, well, I'll just live with the fact that in the world I'm living in now, these contaminants are part of my, my, my life? How do we address some of these philosophical questions? How do, how do we, what messages do we send to the public? Um, I think, generally speaking, the public is really on board with not being exposed to chemicals. Like, if, like and I'm going to use Ms. Fenelay as an example of where things can go wrong as well. So, Ms. Fenelay is one of the most studied chemicals known to man. It um, is rapidly... Yeah, women. Oh, sorry. <laughs> comment, sorry. <laughs> he means human kind. Oh, my apologies. Um, okay, so it's one of the most studied chemicals that we've ever studied. And it's rapidly metabolised and excreted by the human body. Um, it's, it's also weakly estrogenic as well. Now, people are really concerned about being exposed to BPA, and that has led to um, the replacement of BPA, a chemical that we quite well know, with things that we don't know. And that's really the heart of this, one of the hearts of this problem, right? We need to make informed decisions about what chemicals we want to use and where we use them. For example, I have a Gore-Tex jacket when I go hiking. It has a fluoropolymer in it. I like having that jacket because it keeps me dry when it's raining. And I like having these things when I'm hiking that I can get. I get into the tent and I know I'm going to be dry for the night. I feel like that's a sensible place to use a fluoropolymer. And we're making an informed decision that potentially I'm going to have this exposure on my body. I've calculated the potential health impacts and I'm prepared to do it. We need to make those sort of informed decisions about what chemicals we use and where we use them. So the, um, the other question is about um, how we get the public on board. And look, if these chemicals are in your wastewater treatment plan, you're being exposed to these chemicals probably in your home. That's probably the bigger issue, in my opinion. And we need to circuit break this at some point. So, if you're being exposed to this chemical at your house, it's very unlikely that it's going to cause more harm coming through, say, a recycled water program or a biosolids program. You know, you're being exposed to it in the house. So what we actually need to do is have an, an engagement between the regulators and the chemical industry, and the chemical industry needs to prove that the chemical doesn't cause harm before it's introduced to market. not win this fight. We can treat every, as Peter says, we have the ability to treat water to make it clean. We have that technology, we, it's going to be cost prohibitive. We need to, we need to have a philosophical change and it, it, it's really regulators have to drive this. Okay, I've got a list of other questions here, but I'm hoping you guys have got more exciting questions than I do. Uh, so, can we, we've got already a hand up the back there. Yes. Um, Just wait, because we're filming, we need you to have the microphone on. 
it's an idea you've mentioned, but I, I imagine that the Northern Board is right, that this come, comes from, from essentially the rainbow, not to be decided. But obviously that means it, it, it sort of goes with those hands and it goes out to the uh, uh, flat. Yes, um, we have to be very grateful to our forefathers who set aside the catchments. I'm sure there were lots of other competing interests at the time that wanted them. But they set them aside, um, they are closed, which means humans can't go in there and we don't have uh, farm animals either because that could uh, lead to pathogen uh, contamination of the water. So 80% of our water comes from those catchments. And that means that we do not have to put elaborate treatment processes onto that water, which keeps the price down. Perhaps a comment from the point of view of Melbourne as a source is actually probably one of the most protected catchments in the world and that is that is less and less the case for nearly all other catchments in the world. It's a very unique situation in Melbourne. If you just go into country Victoria, if you go into country New South Wales, it's harder and harder and harder to get what we would call a class one catchment. It, it's nearly impossible. Therefore, the chances that other waters around Australia, other than perhaps parts of Sydney, do have the level of protection of Melbourne has, is actually quite low. And we have to start to be concerned about things creeping in. Okay, uh, Dana, I'm told, yes. <laughs> Hang on, can you wait for the microphone? Sorry, oh, okay, go with it, sorry. A uh, question to the panel, maybe specifically to Brad. Apart from separation technologies for removing uh, the past mora, um, are there emerging technologies for destruction of the past? I've been reading recently about, I guess, the forces of forward forces for destruction. Um, what's your thoughts uh, on that? I'll just give you one quick answer, and then I'm going to pass this one to Peter because he's the engineer. Um, <laughs> my fear is that when we des destroy PFOS, PFOA molecules, we might make something worse. Um, so we just need to have evidence that it's fully mineralised when we use these techniques that you're talking about, which are emergent techniques for the mineralisation of PFOS. I, I understand there's still being prototypes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's correct. There, there's indications that, that some types of electrolysis can actually fully mineralise PFOS and PFA, which, which is good. Um, we, we take PFOS and PFOA out of water, we typically put it onto resins and onto granular activated carbon. In actual fact, that's becoming our next legacy. It, it's, it's concentrated now, and uh, if you go to Newcastle and you go to Williamtown Air Base, the, the, there's a legacy build-up of, of granular activated carbon there, or, or PAC. How you actually destroy it off that is going to be our, our next problem. And you can burn it, but you'd like not to have to burn it and destroy the, the substrate and be able to reuse the substrate. We're not there yet on, on those. We've got a lot of work to do, not just on taking it out, which we can do, but actually making sure that we destroy it and actually get some reuse of the adsorbents and things like that that we're using. Just can I add something very quickly? For those of you who work in the research space, uh, the Australian Research Council has put out two specific grant rounds on this very topic. And it will be interesting to see what actually comes out of some of the innovative minds of Australia. Okay, now we'll throw it to Dharma, and then perhaps we'll, we'll get we'll get into a system where the, wherever the mic goes next, I'll get the question going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, uh, just one is a question, and the other one is an uh, observation on the discussion. Uh, just uh, briefly about the uh, microplastics. I read some research uh, done overseas saying that majority of the microplastics are coming from 
the tires. So the risk is very small compared to the amount of microplastic that goes into the environment, at least from our own cars, tires, running on the roads. How are we going to regulate that aspect of it? This is a big question. The second one is uh, about the Peters and Kathy's uh, comment about testing for these substances by water authorities is very cost prohibitive. Even when you looked at uh, cryptosporidium and Jalia coming in the 90s as emerging pathogens, everybody was testing for it, and each test costed us about $400. Ultimately, we decided to apply the CCP, the CCP to manage that situation uh, effectively and cost effectively. Similarly, you have to come up with something here rather than saying, put more barriers in. That means as you put more barriers, you have to clean all these barriers. And then, as Peter said, we will create a concentrate which we have to find a way of disposing. So this adds to the cost to the consumers, and that will blow the existence of water authorities in any way. Well, the first one is microplastics, right? So um, actually textiles is another major source, and so the tyres. Yeah. Okay, I don't think any reasonable person would say, don't use your car because it's going to create plastics. So I feel like that's where we make an informed decision about the types of chemicals we use for a specific application. And then we should pay the cost for dealing with it if we have to. It ends up in the water sector. Then, then the government or the taxes should then um, be factored in for that. The second part of the, the comment, though, is really about why is it the water sector's responsibility to deal with a problem that they're not even designed to deal with? Water treatment really is about all of the conventional treatment processes is about pathogen reduction and nutrients. And all of a sudden, they have to deal with the legacy pollution of all of society. It's really not fair. <laughs> Don't be <pull> off, that is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other comments on those? No? OK, uh, next question then, yep. Uh, I love these uh, panel discussions. I think how long the discussions that take decades to uh, come up with a solution. So, I'm going to make a, a very Macedonian statement that actually asks a question. But uh, looking from being a Melbourne, uh, we can actually just let everything go because uh, our water supply is so clear, everyone will get stupid and we'll just uh, rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very Macedonian. <laughs> My question is, um, climate change, uh, water contamination, these are big, big issues. Um, you know, the amount of drinking water for growing populations. And it's, it's almost adaptation has been accepted now for climate change because it's just not the political will. But there is a groundswell of, uh, of, of people and in terms of magnitude of numbers that are starting to get somewhere. How do you propose to take the lessons that have been learned in that space and apply it to something that's Right, you said it's, it's got to be regulatory driven, but it's got to have a political will. And without people knowing this and driving it, we're just not going to get there unless we go down the pathway of um, people what you suggested in terms of these big ways of dealing with it. The approach that I'm actually talking about, where the burden of proof moves. So at the moment, the current approach is that the burden of proof really is on the environmental scientists or the regulator to prove that something causes harm. Now, it's really the backwards way of thinking about this way of doing it. And the, like, it's really hard to improve things like tobacco, um, now vaping, uh, lead, asbestos. It's really difficult to, perform, to prove that link of this, this exposure to this chemical causes this outcome. Um, it's better off it says a reach regulations in Europe now has, uh, has made some categories and specific chemical requirements that if you're going to introduce a chemical to market, you must prove, you must demonstrate that it is biodegradable, that it's not persisted in the environment, and that uh, it's not toxic. Now, that to me is a better place to put the burden than as on the back foot from scientists trying to first we have to figure out what's in there, because half the time it's proprietary, 
And then we've got to try to like figure, collaborate, like I'm an environmental chemist, so I've got to collaborate with the biologists to expose them, expose some cell lines and some PFOS to then say, oh, they're, I think that's going to cause like uh, thyroid cancer or something like that. You know what I mean? Like it's not the right way of doing it and it's, you get this disjointed response. So pharmaceuticals is probably a pretty good example. They must, they do all the testing and they prove that it's not going to cause harm. And I think it's not about, in my opinion, this isn't about the public. They, they, this is about um, informed people, leaders of the water sector, leaders of uh, the regulators, making these decisions that this is how we're going to manage chemicals in Australia. Um, Brad, I agree with you about the uh, EU and what you've said. I don't know if anyone here had the opportunity to attend an EPA seminar about a year ago about green chemistry. I don't know if you've heard that word before. Um, they had a very uh, persuasive speaker, um, John Warner, who runs Babcock Warner, and their whole ethos is to look at chemicals that we are using in industrial production that are toxic and would have problems if when they're released, and to redesign from scratch to come up with alternatives that are as effective and that are the same price and would not have environmental consequences. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very much um, something that's in its infancy, but something that I think would be a, a wonderful, wonderful way for us to go in the longer run. Okay. Okay. About Machiavellian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, do, I, I do have a comment about the Machiavellian um, statement. Yeah, and it is actually quite insightful. This is the thing about emerging contaminants. You can't think about them in isolation. Um, and we've talked a lot about Melbourne and their wonderful pristine catchments and how lucky, you know, Melburnians, because I'm not a Melburnian, I live in central Victoria. Guess what? We don't have the luxury of a pristine catchment. They went and opened up four of our catchments to recreational access. Thank you very much. Um, and not only that, they're agricultural catchments, so they're covered in pesticides and herbicides. Guess what? We're inland. We can't have, build a detail plant. It's not going to happen. So with growing population, with the pressure of climate change, with outback and western New South Wales and Queensland rapidly approaching a Cape Town style day zero where there is no water and they're talking about trucking in water from the coast, we have to look at alternative water sources. And yes, I'm going to say it, but it will reuse. Um, not only that, but, but you know, if, it's, if it rains, maybe stormwater harvesting. But in many cases, stormwater is almost as filthy as wastewater. So many of our inland towns don't have the luxury of our coastal cities for these reasonably clean source water supplies. And that means we need to take into account both chemicals and pathogens as health risks. And that means that we seriously need to think about treatment barriers, about HACCP and CCPs for our systems. Um, so we've got to get serious about this and we have to have the systems and framework in place and we have to have the regulators on board to help us supply a critical utility service to our outback towns. And I just want to put another one out there, Catherine. Mm -hmm. Catherine is the perfect example where by no fault of their own they have a contaminated drinking water supply and they've had to put a state-of-the-art multi-barrier treatment process in because of PFAS. So, you know, we, we don't have this luxury, basically, for, for all places. Uh, down the back, is it Sam? No, next to Sam. Yeah, front of the um, Thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, I'm curious if the opportunity to create a toast for the chemicals themselves um, and potentially a value creation method for the macro system. And maybe if, uh, if the macro system is too big for micro systems uh, at like concrete sources of contamination. Thank you. I suppose I can start on that one. The, one of the, I, I think all the things that Brad's put up aside, one of the things that happens with chemicals in our society, especially industrials, is that 
we, we effectively socialise the pollution. As, as Judy said earlier, we, we have trade waste licences to put stuff down the sewer and, and in actual fact, as we say to ourselves, actually I do want to make a product out of that biosolid sludge that's not contaminated, I do want to really not have to have six barriers, maybe five barriers to recycle water to potable, we are going to have to put a lot more effort, and there's been a huge amount of effort, but a lot more effort into closed and semi-closed loop systems for industry and for some of those source chemicals. There'll be a scream that says, oh, that's a zero discharge type mentality, that's going to cost me more, my products are going to be more expensive. But in actual fact, that cost is socialised currently. It, it's socialised to Everyone who pays a, in their water bill, they get a wastewater charge. They're paying for that currently. And the question is, if I put it back to source and it sent the cost of that product up more than another one and they went out of business, I don't want to go into politics here other than we're generally not good at that sort of thing, but it says that we do have to go into some closed loop systems to actually start to solve this problem. And in particular, the, the ones where we know that there's problems. There are a lot of chemicals that I call homogeneous. They're the things that everyone uses every day and they finish up in the wastewater and the wastewater treatment process is the place to treat them. But there are a lot of industrial systems where we could go into closed loop. Okay, now we're down the back. No? Add to that one. Let that go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, off you go. Kathy uh, essentially answered this question, but I'd like to <laughs> also get further opinion from Kathy and the rest of the panel. But do you see uh, emerging contaminants of concern as being uh, drivers for more water recycling or potential um, detractors or something which would stop implementation of water recycling? I see in the first instance that the fear of emerging contaminants may be a driver for avoiding uh, looking at recycled water as an alternative water source. But at the same token, I also see it as a driver of innovation and also looking at um, operational efficiencies and cost efficiencies because if we can actually tackle it using the lever of water recycling and you know, offsetting our clean you know, drinking water sources, um, you know, even in a non-potable reuse context, if we can nail this and get it right and demonstrate that it is feasible to do, then it opens up the possibility to say, well, if we can do it and it's actually not that much more expensive on a cost per megalitre basis, can we now actually start talking about using it from a drinking water context? So, yeah, from that perspective, I think there might be a possibility to use it as a lever for innovation. Perhaps, do you want to even mention the Antarctic program in that respect? No? <laughs> Well, Sam knows about Antarctica. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the rest the, of the audience is aside from Sam. <laughs> one, of the, one of the projects that Cathy and I have been involved with for about four or five years now is, is a project on what we call safe discharge to the environment. There's compliant discharge to the environment, but what is truly safe discharge, and you might call that gold standard stuff, whereby you say, I'm going to discharge something that's truly safe. If I get to that point, I've spent an amount of money that says that to be productive, I've got to get that water back into the into reuse, not just for agriculture, but back into industrial use or back into uh, potable use. And the Antarctic project looked at that. First, what was truly safe, and then could we actually, through that, produce really good quality potable water? We showed over a period of uh, about a year, that the quality of the water there was 
as good as or better, in actual fact we've never found anything better in quality out of bottles or out of any drinking water supply out of a tap. Now that's, and, and that includes your water, Dharma, where we did the testing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and therefore that, to me, therefore that's not a technical issue anymore. That, no technology needed. The innovation there that's needed is that our current distribution systems, the way they're set up, our water supply, we have a source, we have a use point, we send it to a wastewater treatment plant. It's not designed actually to say, I'm actually going to reuse that water for potable. The, the argument here is that I don't think necessarily the next generation will be changing the centralised systems, it will be hybrid systems and distributed models that allow people the option to have potable recycle. It might start off as, as uh, purple pipe, but you put actual drinking water into the purple pipe and over time, as regulations and things change, you've got the option to tell people, at your doorstep, you can flip the switch, your choice. If you don't want it, do want it. I'm not a big proponent of purple pipe because I don't think it's highly reductive, but I think it is a transition point for recycle and hybrid systems and going back to a different model of water use and going to more of what I'd call a one water system. And the one water system says we've got, we've got a whole set of water sources and, and we pollute it, we just clean it up, we reuse it and it becomes part of the cycle. Oh, yeah, go for it. Sorry, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> Quickly, go for it. Yeah, I, um, I actually am getting more and more concerned about the use of recycled water on agricultural crops and also biosolids. So, um, biosolids can be used on food um, directly consumed. So that means like spinach and lettuce and things like that. And um, recycled water, as far as I'm aware, can also be used for those sort of same purposes. So food that we directly consume. Um, if you're doing a risk assessment and you want to think about like some of the riskiest activities potentially we could engage with, using these materials in agriculture, when we know that there are chemicals that we can't characterise in them, is a risky activity. So we could reuse our biosolids for other purposes, for example, forestry or mine rehabilitation or other other means, so we don't necessarily have to ban it, but using them for um, crops intended for human consumption, in my opinion, is playing with fire. Um, and the other point I was going to make about Peter was, um, Peter was mentioning about um, protecting your product, protecting your biosols, protecting your recycled water. So um, in the late 80s, early 90s, Sydney Water made the decision that they were going to reuse biosolids in New South Wales. And the, to that point, all of their biosols were heavily contaminated with heavy metals. And they just said, we will not accept these, um, if your trade waste contains elevated levels of these seven metals, um, you will not be able to put it into the sewer. Uh, within a matter of months, their biosolids were um, not metal free, because nothing's metal free, but uh, significantly reduced. So there are mechanisms about how we protect the products that we want to recycle. Um, Brad, yes, interesting, interesting comments there. Um, something we do need to remember too is that some of the metals that will be coming through actually are coming out of our tap fittings and the various piping that we actually have in our homes. And that can contribute to the different grading of the biosolids on, on a chemical basis. Um, regarding uh, risks from recycled water, in about 2008, we started a very ambitious project called a quantitative risk assessment, trying to get a handle on what were the most important uh, contaminants we really should be looking at, what could be coming into our, into our sewer catchments. Looking at things like high production volume chemicals and working with some, um, I'd say, very forward-thinking consultants as well to try and develop a framework that we can actually use to pick out priority chemicals that we need to regulate and uh, particularly pick up in trade waste. 
And so that has given us a framework to deal with a lot of these issues, uh, working together with the retailers in Melbourne. Okay, now there's somebody who's been dying to ask a question. Up back here. Yeah. good question. We actually had a forum here about a month ago on, on that topic and it's a really, really difficult one because at one level there is a huge amount of organic waste that goes to our sewers and into our landfills that once it's there is unproductive because it's contaminated with a whole range of other stuff that that makes it unusable. Therefore, there is, a, there is a very important part of the whole organics recycling side of things that says get the separation done early in the process and don't get it into landfill, don't get it into the sewer because once it's in landfill or once it's in the sewer, it is intractable effectively. It's mixed with too many other things. That's the first thing, and, and I think the plastics debate that's happening at the moment, which is do we have to sort tremendously differently at the household level, at a whole range of levels? Do we need six different bins for our plastics instead of, of, of one? Is, is an important part of that. The analysis of where all the organics that go to landfill and, and, and the sewer come from is that a huge amount of it is, is point source stuff from green grocers and a whole range of, of groups that could change. That's the first point. The second very quick point is there are organic mixtures that do finish up in landfill and do finish up in the sewer, even if you've done the best possible job taking out the things that you want to reuse, that, that represent what I would call the bad side of society, the things that we just got rid of and, and that they, they probably need to be destroyed. And everyone goes, oh, that'll you know, create greenhouse gases. The volume isn't actually all that great, but they probably do need to be destroyed to break that pollution cycle. And, and therefore, you don't want to have to burn a whole bunch of stuff there. You want to reduce it to a concentrate that, that you are probably going to have to destroy or pyrolyze or do something with in that context because it is quite toxic. I think the really big question for us is can we reduce the volume of that by not putting things that are highly recyclable with it? Okay, Mike. Thank you. Uh, it's a question mainly for Brad, but, and I certainly don't want to denigrate any of the excellent conversation that we've had already today, but it's been almost entirely anthropocentric. We are only talking about human um, effects and effects on you know, drinking water, that sort of thing. There's a whole natural environment out there. We only have to look forward to, um, or further north to the Murray-Darling Basin to see about the great conflict between human use of water and the environment and the battles that are going on there. So my question to Bradley is, are we able to look at the effect of chemicals, and I'm speaking as an analytical chemist here, or are we better looking at effects? and see, because you've mentioned, what was it, 147 million different chemicals, maybe there are 5,000 or 10,000 in our uh, wastewater streams that are going out into the environment and affecting not only us, but all of the biota in the streams. We found 
recently that platypus living in some of Melbourne streams are getting half the daily dose of antidepressants that an adult human taking those drugs is getting. Who knows what effect that's pretty, having? Pretty happy platypus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unless they're sitting back in the bank saying, there's an eagle up there, right over there. <laughs> then, then we've got a problem. But you know, one of the things we're grappling with, and I'm interested in your opinions, is should we be looking at characterising all the chemicals, or should we be looking at effects, and therefore at non-lethal effects as well? So sub-lethal effects that can have major implications. Well, the answer to your question is yes, we should uh, be moving away from targeted analysis. Um, we cannot possibly win in that battle. So when I say targeted analysis, it means that I have decided that I'm going to measure PFOS in this water, and I've purchased the standard, and I have a mass spec specific for doing that measurement, and then I'm going to add in another chemical. Now, of the entire chemical universe, we are analytical chemistry is moving to the ability to do non-targeted work, but it's actually not the right way to do it. So the US EPA and California state government has moved to a system and they said, right, we want to know what the effect of the chemicals are in this water sample. So you use a process called cell bioassays, and so you might look for estrogenicity, for example. So you take all of the chemicals out of your water and you're exposed to cell lines. So this really is the way that the Americans have moved, and it really is the way that we should move to. So you say, when you get a hit on this effect, then you go, what is the chemical that might be causing that effect? So we go in a different direction. So you probably want to have a combination. You need to have regulated chemicals. <coughs> we really should have a monitoring program. So we say, here are some suspects we think might be a problem. We add them to a regulatory monitoring program and we start generating data. The biggest thing we don't have currently is a lot of data. What is the typical PFOS level in Australian effluents? So that would become the a second thing, and then we need cell biases. So we could have, say, 10 critical, I'm going to say human health endpoints, and the reason for that is because most of the funding is really driven by human health endpoints, because I would love to do some research on platypuses, so if anyone <laughs> wants to fund me doing some work on the impact of PFOS on platypuses, I am in, um, the rates aren't too high. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I would love to see what the impact is in the environment. Because, yeah, they're being exposed, the native fauna is being exposed to all of the same cocktail of chemicals, probably even worse than we are. Yeah, just, just add on that, um, um, Oh, you're coming in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's just, it's, we are in a very globalised uh, society that we are talking pretty much catsmen, local catsmen, but actually it is not going to work. Is on the issue locally. Because, for example, she was talking about the Central Victorian catchments are much, much worse than mm. Melbourne catchment. Uh, so probably um, the you know any source of food coming here, the food chain concept, that how uh, this contaminant would transfer from um, lower food chain level to the higher food chain level. That this is we have not talked today at all. So an, an ecological issue that what you just mentioned about uh, how this contaminant is passing uh, from water to fish and fish. Okay, I'm going to give Judy yeah. one chance to respond. Then we're going to get time for one more question. So if you have uh, the last question, grab the mic. Go, Judy. Okay, Mike, I agree with you. We haven't talked much about the environment. As part of the quantitative risk assessment, we have actually done work in that area uh, there's some very sophisticated modelling programs where you actually establish food webs uh, using your local species. You build them in com in, uh, as part of a computer program and then you look at the potential exposure through their food sources and one can get an idea of the risk involved. Um, sampling animals and checking things is always very difficult and I'm sure the platypus probably wouldn't want to cooperate with your experiments, Brad. Um, they might not be very eager. But, um, and that they obviously uh, would be difficult uh, to catch, get samples, etc. I think we need to write an ARC um, industry supported project, please. <laughs> no, ecological risk, sorry, but ecological risk is probably, you know, it's, it's, the Water Research Australia has just identified it as a significant uh, one of their one, one and two priorities of what they need to understand. Yes. Okay, I'm going to throw to our last question for the night. So we, we talked about the risk um, but I was wondering from a 
consumer point of view, what is what can we do and what should be our responsibility not to bring things in the sink in the sewer? And is it part partly the responsibility as well of the regulators to indicate the population? I know it's a long way because you look at the recycling and still there is still people don't know how to recycle. But what can we do in the world point of view? My biggest problem is to be to demand that consumers make ethical, everyone should make ethical choices as much as they can, but just figuring out what chemicals are being impregnated into, you know, the, your burger wrapper, for example, has PFAS all through it. Um, your makeup has, well, I don't know if you wear makeup, but um, people's makeup has all these different types of chemicals in it. So, um, how does the consumer, and our clothing is also covered in chemicals as well. I don't think it's just, if we're going to really solve the problem of chemicals, there needs to be some high level thinking and there needs to be some action so we need to reduce the numbers really as well. And I don't, I personally, I know like years ago it was like, oh, the, the, the home should decide about, you know, ethical investments and you know, recycled toilet paper and all this sort of stuff. I, I just think it's unfair, there's so much pressure on people these days, and, and the people with knowledge and experience in chemicals should be the people proposing ways of managing them properly. Because, you know, you see all the things you put in your supermarket trolley, do you really have to know every single one of them about what the chemicals are in there? I think, I think that's fair. Any other point? Also on that one. Okay, I'm going to draw things to a close. So firstly, I'd like to thank all our speakers, Bradley Clark, Judy Beard, Peter Scales and Kathy Northcote. Can we give them a round of applause?